just use them in a dog. Hi <clears throat> right, guys. All right, let me uh, croak out this rat here. It is now a hot, sticky yuck. It is a Saturday here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the great state of Texas <clears throat> where uh, me and the little dog, we have to head to a picking party. You will be shocked to hear that I'm uh, going to another picking party to be a super spreader to my friends, I guess. <clears throat> so anyway, since it is Saturday, uh, good Lord, it is time for our hopium apocaloptimism roundup rant. And good Lord, we have an overflowing tub of hopium in here today. So uh, can't spend a lot of time on any of these, but uh, I mentioned this story on Manga Bay yesterday all over the mainstream media this week. For those of you who are, uh, do you remember that thing called COP26? COP26 is back in the news this week. And this is BBC's rendition of this story. <coughs> COP26 promises will hold warming under 2C. Right here. COP26 promises will hold warming under 2C. All right. The carbon cutting promises made at COP26 would see the world warm by just under 2C this century, according to a new analysis. The study finds that if, as we talked about in Manga Bay yesterday, that if, first, all right, let's take all the words in this sentence. First, the word if, and then after the word if is the word all. If all the pledges made by countries are implemented, if all are implemented in full and on time, temperatures would rise by 1.9 to 2C. So somewhere just above 1.9 if all are implemented in full and on time. Yes. Uh, when political leaders met in Glasgow, many of them brought new and improved plans to reduce their carbon emissions. Yes, others such as India announced new long-term targets to bring their CO2 output to net zero. Yes. Uh, there you go. This is a new peer-reviewed study. Uh-huh. <clears throat> All right. This is lead author Professor Malti Manshausen from the University of Melbourne. This is the first paper, and I'm assuming the only paper, <coughs> that says there is actually a better than 50% <coughs> chance of keeping temperatures below <coughs> 2C if these targets are implemented. There you go. So how is Time Magazine weighing in on the Doomers? That was BBC. What is Time Magazine up to? Now is not the time to give in to climate fatalism. Yes. We are at an agonizing moment in world history. 
the combined stresses of the war in Ukraine, the climate crisis, and economic troubles stemming from spiking oil and gas prices, inflation, and growing global inequality have pushed us to our limits geopolitically, environmentally, and psychologically. After centuries of colonialism, intensive resource extraction, and narrow short-term thinking, the chickens have come home to roost. But, but, what if we could feed three birds with one scone? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> following the release of climate reports, such as the recent IPCC assessments, we often observe a surge of doomism when headlines proclaim it is now or never to limit warming, some assume we won't do what's needed in time. And if you think there's nothing we can do, why bother trying? Uh, I feel like I might have already read this story. The problem with now or never is that it implies a hard threshold at one and a half C that if we fail to achieve, it's game over. But this game will never be over. Yes, but this game will never be over. You heard it in Time Magazine. There is no point beyond which we should not keep trying to limit warming. Yes, every fraction of a degree matters to the level of suffering climate disruption will rain down on us. Yes. Uh, anyway, now is not the time for climate fatalism. Yes. Uh, okay, we have heard from the BBC and Time. What does USA Today have to say to the apocalyptimist? Here is the thing about that dire climate report. Here is the thing about that dire climate report. We have the tools we need to fix things. Yes. This week's UN climate report painted an ominous picture. Yes, if humanity does not act now, the earth could warm as much as three degrees Celsius. At those temperatures, major cities will be underwater. Unprecedented heat waves will define summers. Terrifying storms will become more frequent, and millions of plant and animal species will go extinct. Yes, making that shift seems daunting. Mm. But with wind today, with wind power 72% cheaper and solar 90% cheaper than in 2009, Officials say it is actually within reach. This is Inger Anderson, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program. We have the knowledge and the technology to get this done. And I am feeling like, uh, I'm feeling like I have already done this rant. Is are all of these just uh, running together? But anyway, uh, I honestly don't know if I've already read these hopium stories. They just start all sounding the same. But uh, we're probably all wondering what we can do. All right. What each one of us can do to impact our global heating footprint. 
Here are six fairly simple steps since keeping your pecker in your pants is not that simple. Uh, I did not make the list of the simplest thing to do to impact your global eating footprint is to keep your pecker in your pants or do not let your knickers down since neither one of those suggestions are on here. Okay, the six ways you personally can save the planet and you can let your pecker just go boing, boing, boing and you just let your knickers down, girl. Because breeding is nowhere on this list. <clears throat> Number one, eat a largely plant-based diet with healthy portions and no waste. Number two, buy no more than three new items of clothing per year. Number three, keep electrical products for at least seven years. Number four, take no more than one short haul flight every three years and one long haul flight every eight years. Yes. Number five, get rid of your motor vehicles if you can. And if you can't, keep hold of your existing vehicle for longer. And number six, make at least one life shift to nudge the system like moving to a green energy electric provider, insulating your home, or changing your pension supplier. Okay, and you do those six things, you will save the planet, and you can go right on uh, doing with your pecker what you want. All right. But uh, I guess even, uh, even after you're dead, you can uh, keep saving the planet after you're dead, as we now have eco-friendlier coffins. Yes. Uh, so we have the environmentally friendly cardboard coffin. Life Art Asia has cardboard coffins made of recycled wood fiber that can be customized with designs on the exterior. Yes. Uh, So, uh, the company says its cardboard coffins went burned during cremation emits 87% less greenhouse gas compared to those made of wood or wood substitutes. Each coffin weighs about 23 pounds and can carry a body that weighs up to 440 pounds. <coughs> so you can weigh 440 pounds and you can keep saving the planet even after you are dead. All right, uh, but uh, you know all these doomers talking about you know the shift to this uh, this bullshit green energy revolution. You know how it's going to ramp up mining. Uh, I guess it's the the big mining association is now saying 500 to 1,000 percent 
over the next 30 years that there will be five to ten times as more mines on the planet in 30 years to save the planet than there are now. Uh, but this is not a bad thing. Because mines, mines themselves can become huge carbon sinks, researchers say. All right. <clears throat> there is no shortage of environmental impacts associated with the mining industry, with some of the top concerns being the contamination of the soil, the water, and air. <clears throat> mining processes also release significant amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, which raises questions about how the mining industry will expand global operations, you know, by five to ten times over while improving its sustainability. Yes. Um, uh, and this is particularly an issue for mines that produce the metals and rare earth minerals needed for products to achieve net zero economies such as solar panels and electric vehicles. Yes. Uh, so, how can the mining industry reduce greenhouse gas emissions as demand soars? Mm -hmm. A company founded by researchers at the University of British Columbia proposes one potential solution. Carbon Minerals uh, is a carbon capture company <coughs> that partners with mines and uses their technology to turn the mines tailing ponds into quote huge carbon sinks. Yes. <coughs> this is somebody Mr. Dipple. Mr. Dipple. So this technology is one where we're taking the waste from the mine. The tailings. So the tailings, which is that finely ground up rock that is left over after, you know, these rare earth metals are removed. Yes. Those waste minerals and the tailings are naturally reactive to the carbon dioxide in the air. Uh, yes. Uh, when this material is exposed to the atmosphere, it naturally absorbs carbon dioxide in the air and it turns that carbon dioxide into minerals. So it is essentially taking carbon dioxide and putting it into rock. Yes. Uh, carbon minerals technology will eventually be done by robots due to the health hazards that tailing ponds can present. Yes. Oh, Jesus. We're so fucked. Okay. Uh, what are some more of these tools? All right. Colony of cells will be all over this one. <clears throat> this bacteria powered battery eats up methane to spit out electricity. Yes. When discussing climate change, carbon dioxide sucks up a lot of the air, so to speak. Less attention is spent on methane, which accounts for 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions, but is 80 times 
more powerful at trapping heat. Yes, you've probably already heard that cow farts are a big contributor to atmospheric methane, but rotting organics and natural gas can also expel methane into the air. Uh-huh. But a new, unique method may convert methane into a usable energy source with the help of a microscopic friend, bacteria. Yes, a team of researchers from the Netherlands say they have constructed a battery consisting of methane munching bacteria that convert the gas into electricity. Says Cornelia Welter, a microbiologist, study co-author, quote, this could be very useful for the energy sector. Yes. Oh, God. What do we got? Let's do two more. And do not forget, while all of those methane munching bacteria are hard at work, the holy grail of energy generation might, might finally be within our grasp. Yes. Take a wild guess what we're talking about. We're talking about nuclear fusion. Yep. Depending on who you talk to, we are either on the cusp of one of the most important breakthroughs in all of science and technology, or we are a long way away from our goals. We have been on a quest to unlock the potential of nuclear fusion for a long time. They took it back to 1934. In 1934 uh, was the first reference that they could find to saving the planet with nuclear fusion. But talking about uh, ideas we've heard before, a seed bank, a seed bank in Colombia is helping to climate-proof food systems. Yes, as extreme weather and drought affect agriculture all over the world, securing both food systems and farmers' livelihoods is becoming increasingly vital. The Future Seeds Gene Bank, which opened last month in Colombia, is the world's largest collection of beans, cassavas, and tropical climate forages for livestock. Yes. I think uh, we remembered what happened the last time we tried to uh, create a doomsday seed vault for eternity. I think it, it lasted about 10 years up there buried in the... Uh, in the permafrost and it melted about 10 years into the 10,000 year reign of the seed bank. So now we're going to go in a tropical country to start a seed bank. Anyway, guys, I could go on with this, but uh, the little dog and I, we have to head to a picking party. So, uh, I'm sure everyone at the picking party is going to be talking about all the ways we can save the planet. I highly suggest you get out to a picking party while you still can. Bye, guys.